talk about is one that I love, and that's the election of 1980. And the reason I love it is because I was just in the eighth grade in 1980, fixing to go from middle school to high school, and everyone was, was even then, was talking about the upcoming election. Uh, I can remember when Nixon resigned from office and how uh, President Ford took over and pardoned him, and that caused him to get beaten by Jimmy Carter. And what's going to happen in the election of 1980, because people are in such um, – uh, uh, I, I don't know how you would word. They were just in. Uh, th- they were desperate. Things were not going well. And even as a kid, uh, an eighth grader, I could tell things weren't going well. And uh, the country now is wanting to move to a conservative leader. And Jimmy Carter was the president. He was he was uh, a one time governor of Georgia. He lived in a a small uh, community in uh, Georgia. He was a very nice man. A very moral person. And he's still alive to this day. Um, but during his administration, things just went really bad. We had a gas shortage with him uh, as president, and then we had the Iran hostage crisis when he was our president. And I can remember going to math class when this was going on, and our, he authorized a rescue attempt uh, by our military that failed, and it was, it was catastrophic. And I remember my eighth grade math teacher stopping. Um, he didn't even teach that day. He just lectured us on how you got to do your job and do it right because uh, he said it was probably somebody didn't tighten uh, a nut on a boat on one of the helicopters tight enough, and it just caused a chain reaction. Uh, I remember leaving that classroom thinking somehow um, it was my fault <laughs> that this happened, even though it wasn't. But Jimmy Carter was was looked at as being ineffective. He gave a speech called the Malay speech where uh, in front of uh, Americans, um, he, he said, uh, you know, Americans have fallen into a great malaise, uh, that, that, you know, a lot of apathy and things like that, and it really hurt him. Well, Ronald Reagan is going to run against him, and he's proposing a new economic policy that's going to be known as Reaganomics, which is actually trickle-down economics. Um, and he had an image of being tough on communism, and he was not afraid to use the military. I, I can remember when he was elected how that we had some uh, students that were going to a medical school in Grenada, and Grenada was being overtaken by communists, and he sent our troops in without even batting an eye and rescued them. Um, one of the biggest ones was uh, he was having difficulty with uh, Libya and the leader there, Muammar Gaddafi. And Qaddafi would shoot at our planes and our ships that he said was in uh, Libya's um, control, their airspace and water. And uh, Reagan warned him, said, you better not do this again. Well, Qaddafi did. Uh, Guys, we bombed. Ronald Reagan had our Air Force and Navy bomb Qaddafi's house. I mean, that's just easy. I mean, we we whipped them. We actually had a joke as teenagers that we would say, um, how does Muammar Gaddafi um, inspect his Navy? And the answer is in a glass bottom boat because we sunk his Navy. I mean, we that's just how we were. But um, look at the, the election. Guys, Ronald Reagan won this by a landslide. Now, these are all electoral votes. Uh, you only have one, two, three, four <coughs> Five, maybe six states that he won. He won Georgia, his home state, and then you've got West Virginia, and then you've got some small states there uh, uh, above Virginia that he won, and it was a devastating loss to Jimmy Carter, but it it showed that Americans were tired of the way things were going, and they felt like this was going to be the greatest change. Um, now, what did Ronald Reagan do? Well, this is what Reaganomics looks like. Um, he, first of all, if you look here, um, the growth of spending, government spending, he reduced that. He said, I'm going to cut spending uh, by the federal government. He had a speech uh, or a saying he, he used to use. Uh, he said, you know good and well that um, the problem isn't you know, he said, the, the government says I'm here to help you, 
but he said no. The pro with the problem, the government's here to help you with the problem. He said, but no, the government is the problem. And he said, I'm going to cut spending. The second thing he did was he cut the income taxes and the capital gains tax. The income tax is go cutting the ends going to help the middle class, the workers, so they can keep more of their money. And people who are workers love when that happens. But he also decreased the capital gains taxes, which is monies that you make on investments, which generally back in those days the wealthier people had. And there was a reason for this. Um, he also, on number three, cut regulation on businesses. And people think that regulation is good, and it is in some cases when it has to do with protecting your health and, and safety. But uh, I will tell you now that uh, whenever the government regulates a business, it causes the price of whatever that business is producing, whether it be a service or a product, it causes the price to go up. So in effect, it is the U.S. citizens that pay the price for the cost of regulation. And then he also did an expansion of uh, he the, the money, uh, the money supply. And that will cause inflation if you don't watch it very well. All right. Now look at the top right hand corner, and you guys, uh, this one's this is a political cartoon. Anybody know who this fellow right here is? You can you can click the talk button and tell me, or you can type it in the chat box. This person right here standing over this what looks to be a fountain. Oh, come on now. This gentleman right here. Who is that person? Oh, please don't make me stay here, folks. I'm going to give you five seconds, and I'll give you the answer. You're not sure, but who have we been talking about? This is Ronald Reagan, and um, yeah, it's Reagan. And uh, notice the, the fountain on the top where all the water is. What does that say? Who are those people, the rich? And then notice below that you've got the middle class and then the poor. What do you think this political cartoon is showing or representing? And we kind of talked about it with this. It has to do with money, yeah. And money is being poured. The rich get most of the money. And you see that little drop? Can you all see that little drop right here on the edge of the, the fountain that has the rich in it? That little bitty dot? That's a drop of water. And, and it's supposed to slide down and drain into the middle class until the middle class overflows and then it drains down into the poor. That is the definition of Reaganomics or trickle down economics. Now let me ask you guys this. Do you think that his policies of Reaganomics trickle down economy is it being portrayed in a positive light or a negative light in this political cartoon? Negative, I got a negative, negative light. Yeah, it, it, it is. Now, I will tell you this as a person who lived during this time. My dad will tell you that uh, it, it doesn't look fair. He said, but we in the middle class actually did do better uh, with this. And the idea is if you, if you cut the uh, restraints or regulations on businesses and lower their taxes and lower the people's taxes, they have more money to spend. They're going to buy more, and if you buy more stuff, then the companies have to make more stuff, and to make more stuff, they have to hire more people. And so, you know, it, it trickles on down. Um, look at this political cartoon below. And on the, the, the um, newspaper that he's reading, it says, Economic Growth, and I can't see that, uh, reduces deficit to a new low. All right? Uh, and and look at what it says on the, the chalkboard. That young man, is, I remember when I was in elementary school, 
they made you write sentences if you were misbehaving. I will not talk in class, you know, that kind of thing. And this, this student's writing, we can grow out of the deficit. Does anyone um, know what, a, what deficit is, what it means? If you, if you give it a shot, either click the microphone one time and, and talk or write it in the chat box. I, you're right, it's a shortage of, of something, but in monetary terms, it basically means that you spend more money than you take than you take in. And the first time we did this was during the Great Depression. Uh, and there are economic uh, experts out there that will tell you that it's okay to do this. But I, let me give you just a little information. I, I did a little... Uh, looking into this a few moments ago and uh, just on the, the there's a difference between the deficit and the amount of debt we owe right now uh, our deficit looks like this we've increased our revenues in the government by two percent so far this year that's 36 billion dollars but we've increased our spending by six percent or a hundred and thirty five billion dollars so we're we're living in a deficit. Now, if you are a, a, a have a family and you're the breadwinner, or you you and your spouse are breadwinners, or whatever, if you spend more money than you take in, what's going to happen to you? I'm talking about month after month and year after year, your family spends more money than they take in. What's going to happen? You got debt, All right? Um, anybody know what our debt is right now? Not our deficit, but our debt. It's in the trillions. I will tell you this: when um, when uh, George Bush, forty-five, um, left office, we were about eight trillion dollars in debt. Right now, we are twenty-two trillion dollars in debt, and it's growing. You can actually um, find the U.S. national debt clock online and it's a, a running clock right now uh, to pay our debt uh, if every citizen in America whether they're being born right now to the moment that they die would have to come up with sixty eight thousand dollars now it's more than that if you just count the taxpayers in order for us to pay our debt today every taxpayer in America would have to come up with a hundred and eighty three thousand dollars so don't y'all feel good about your future? <laughs> we are we are putting you guys in debt. All right. Uh, yay! I would tell that to my kids at Chippen High School, and they would come in there all talking and just all excited about life. And I'd tell them, well, uh, right now uh, you owe about one hundred and sixty thousand dollars. Yeah, woohoo! Way to go. <laughs> just keep on spending. All right. Uh, Oh, and my time is over. Daggum it. I was enjoying this, y'all. Uh, and by the way, this is the first one I've done in about a year. Do y'all think I did okay? I am i don't see nothing. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, you did great. Oh, well, I'm <laughs> – well, you, hey, Mr. Campbell's fixing to get on uh, here and talk to you. Uh, about the the nukes and all that kind of stuff, um, I enjoyed it, y'all. I will be working in the chat box, Mr. Campbell. I'll turn it over to you. I appreciate it. Okay, can you guys hear me all right? Awesome. Okay, terrific. Good, good. So this part here, I just want to show you. You know, that we talked about Reaganomics here and this philosophy of reducing spending and reducing taxes and it's going to lead us to economic prosperity. Well, that really hasn't changed a whole lot. So I'm going to play you an ad and I'm going to see what if you can pick up any themes of Reaganomics uh, out of here. So give me one second. Let me get it for you. And you'll see how little it's changed. Let's see here. 
And if you're on a phone, you may not be able to see this. Try it this way. Well, it's not going to play for you guys here. One second here. We can try one more. In Hillary Clinton's America, the middle class gets crushed. Spending goes up. Taxes go up. Hundreds of thousands of jobs disappear. It's more of the same, but worse. In Donald Trump's America, working families get tax relief. Millions of new jobs created. Wages go up. Small businesses thrive. The American dream achievable. Okay, so were you guys able to see that quick little ad? Yeah, if you're on the phone, you might not have been able to. Carla or Ali, were you able to watch, see the video or all, all of? Okay. So what were some of the things that were similar to Reaganomics there? Okay, good. More jobs being available, good. Tax relief. And the first part, I know it's tough to see because it's quick, because it's just a little ad, is the idea that they, you know, they talked about Hillary Clinton. They said, oh, she's going to raise taxes, and it's going to cause their jobs to be lost. And you know, it was kind of the opposite. So this theme, even though we're talking about the 1980s and we're talking about you know, <laughs> you know, 30, 40 years ago, this is still going on. Okay, and this, this philosophy is still around, and you'll see it in the political ads as you watch it here as this coming up election. Um, so we're still, we don't call it Reaganomics really anymore, but you'll, the same concepts are still around, um, which has also led us to this, this deficit that we've got going on, too. <laughs> You're not going to see any ads that say, we want to raise your taxes and spend less as the government to help pay down our debt. You're not going to see that ad, but you're going to see ads like this. Um, okay, so the next big event that we had going on, and one of the big events going on in the 18, in 1980s, is the Berlin Wall. Okay, and now you guys kind of went over some of this in Module 7, but Berlin after World War II, you can see here was divided up. Like when the two armies, the Allies, you had the, the English and the United States of, uh, you know, armies, they met on one side, and the other side you had the Russian armies meet. Well, they divided the country of Germany into pieces. And you can see you got England here, and the United States, and France, and then you have the Russian USSR. Well, you've got the capital of Berlin here, too. And in the city of Berlin, they divided the city up the same way. And you had the allies you know, of England and France and the United States, and they had sections of the city. And then you had the USSR had a section of the city. Well. England and France and the United States, we basically gave that back and started the Western Germany, and they got to start a democratic country. And they did the same thing in the zones of Berlin. But the Russian side kept that portion of the city in, in, the, in this section of the country. You had East Germany, which becomes a communist country, and Berlin is actually divided that way, where one half is communist and one half is democratic. Well, 
what happens is if you live in East Germany and you want to get to West Germany, you would go to Berlin and then cross the middle of the city and you'd move over to the, the western side of the city and now you'd be considered in West Germany and then you'd take a train or a plane out of there to leave. So this becomes a problem. So uh, Russia or the USSR, they decide they're going to build a wall in the 1960s to barricade off the city. And this is what the kind of the wall looks like. You got East Berlin over here, and literally there's a wall built here. Then there's a, you know the chain link, and then there's guard towers and dogs and bunkers with guns, and a ditch and more barricades, and then another wall. And literally, this you know this is. It's hard because we don't really see this today. But literally, if you jumped the wall and you tried to cross this area, they would shoot and kill you. Okay, so that's how serious it was. It wasn't like, oh, we'll just get by the wall and we'll come around or we'll claim, you know, whatever. No, they were deadly serious about this wall that you were not going to escape into West Berlin. Um, and people, and it literally went right through buildings. It's, it divided the city right in half. People tried to tunnel underneath it. They tried to find their ways around the Berlin Wall. Um, but it's this huge symbol of um, communist rule, that they're not going to allow these people to escape. Everybody with me so far? Okay. So in the 1980s, and, uh, you know, you have, throughout the years, you have pressure from the 1960s all the way to the 80s trying to get them to tear down the wall. And uh, finally, in, 19, uh, in the 1980s, the wall is going to come down uh, very slowly, and it's a huge surprise to everybody. Uh, Ronald Reagan visited there in that, I think it was in that year, trying to demand that the wall was going to be torn down, um, and it's this huge event that nobody expected to happen. So, um, so I'm going to play just a little clip because to give you an idea of what this kind of feels like, um, because I know nobody, none of you guys can remember it, know it. So give me one second here, just so you can get an idea how big of an event this was at this time. Okay, so hopefully that gives you a feeling of what it's like. It'd be sort of like, and it's day if you talked about like, um, if you had say North Korea and South Korea open up their borders between each other and allow people to travel between them. You know, it was a huge event. It was completely unexpected, and the people that lived in East Germany or East Berlin had no idea what was going on in West. If you notice, the one guy was saying, and they, they just want to go see what's going on because they had you know, state-controlled media, state-controlled everything, so they didn't even know what was happening over in the West. So they just want to go see it. Um, so, and then this is going to eventually be the start of all of Germany unifying, and that the, the communist-controlled parts of Germany are going to fall away, and then they're going to form the country again of Germany as we think of it today, and it's going to cause eventually the, the, the the whole USSR is going to break apart. And then, you know, so that you look on the map today, you don't see USSR, you see Russia, and you see Yugoslavia, and you see all the areas broken apart. At one time, if you look in the map of 1970s, that's all considered USSR, it's all considered one country, and they will all fall apart. So this is like the starting blocks of it. Um, any questions about that? Everybody with me? So this is a good one to put on your chart too. If you're working on 802, I forget who it was that said that we're working on 802. This is a good event to put on there, and you'll see this in your text too. Okay, now this one is not really in your chapter, but you can use it on 802 because it is a huge event um, in this time period. So, um, and they, there's like a little small thing in your lessons about this, but the fear of nuclear war, the fear of nuclear accidents was a huge thing in the 1980s, and it still is today, but um, just so you can give you an idea, here's a chart, if you looked in here, and this chart will show you, and this is the global nuclear arsenal, um, and that's basically how many nuclear weapons they had each, or 
in the world. So you can see in 1960 there's very few, okay, and then coming into the 1980s, we're up here at the top. So in the 1980s, they had 64,000, basically, 64,000 nuclear weapons available to use. And, and it's really only between a few countries at that time. It's us, USSR, England, there's not too many countries out there that have it. But there's that m many nuclear weapons out there. And there's a huge fear that we're going to, someone's going to use one accidentally. You know, they talked a lot about it in school, you had drills, um, you know, it was a huge fear that we were going to blow up the world. Um, you know, at any moment in time, okay? So, you know, they come into the late 80s, they start to say, okay, we've got to reduce these, uh, the number of nuclear weapons. So you've got over here the INF Treaty. You've got Ronald Reagan and Gorbachev. They come together, and this is Gorbachev is the leader of Russia, and they agree to, okay, we're going to start limiting some of our nuclear weapons. We're going to start destroying some of our nuclear weapons. Um, there's also the SALT treaties that come about in this time period, which is in your chapter two. But we're trying to reduce down, and you can see here uh, that they steadily go down. So in 2014, there's 9,000, or basically 10,000 um, nuclear weapons, which is still plenty to blow up the world you know, a couple times over, but just the sheer numbers are reduced. It's actually, there is some fears right now that we're going to start increasing this again um, because recently we uh, just got out of one of these nuclear uh, treaties with Russia. I think it was the SALT Treaty. And so there is some fears today that this number may start growing again. So, but in the 1980s, this was a tremendous fear uh, of, of nuclear, that we're going to have nuclear destruction. Um, also, there was fears up here of nuclear accidents. Anybody know what this site is up here in the upper right-hand corner? Any guesses? There you go. Good job, Hannah. This is Chernobyl. This is a picture of Chernobyl. Um, there's actually an HBO series about it. I haven't seen it, but I heard it's pretty good. Uh, you can actually go to Chernobyl today. It's like a tourist area, but you still can't live there. They're, you know, They had a, a nuclear meltdown, the reactor melted down, and um, <laughs> yeah, and uh, you know, it basically, you know, it, it scattered so much radiation that they closed down the cities around it. And there's this huge area where it's just barren. Nobody can live there. And you can go there and see the buildings and stuff like that. Um, like I said, you can't live there, but you can go see it. Um, but it, it wiped out all kinds of vegetation, all kinds of animals. It, it was, it was, you know, it killed a lot of people. So they had that going on. Well, right here, too, in the United States, we had our own nuclear accident happen in the 1980s. Um, this is in Pennsylvania, and um, we have Seven Mile Island here, and we nearly have a nuclear meltdown. Um, we ended up they ended up releasing some some they say it didn't it wasn't too harmful, but uh, uh, it, they released gases, you know, and they had a little bit of radiation in the gases, and they they let it out into the air, so they didn't have a, a nuclear meltdown. But it spurred our own fears about nuclear power and is it safe and should we have this and, you know, a fear that we're, we don't know what we're doing with nuclear. Um, you know, it can cause major accidents. And Mr. Lamb, he lived over by a nuclear power plant and uh, they gave him a, a radio basically that if something went wrong and the, at the nuclear power plant, they had so many minutes to get out of there uh, because the nuclear power plant was going to... Uh, <laughs> to melt down, and you needed to leave. So they, you know, you just had so much fear of this happening. And we've had other incidents over time, like in Japan in the 2000s, there was an earthquake or a tsunami that hit it and it damaged the nuclear power plant. And then, um, yeah, they do, they would test it too. <laughs> this is only a test. Run for your life. So, um, so there was a tremendous fear in the 1980s about nuclear, and it helped start up some of these. Uh, groups that are still around today, like Greenpeace and other other groups trying to fight uh, the use of nuclear power, nuclear weapons, uh, it all still really starts out in the 1980s. Okay, I know we're running short on time here, so we're trying to wrap this up here. Movies of the 1980s, I just wanted to kind of show you a little bit of entertainment um, here from the time period. This also fit on your chart. But let's start here and let's see if you guys can pick up some of the symbolism. Like, let's look at the one in the middle here with Rocky here, Rocky IV. What are some of the symbolisms you see in this poster? Hmm. 
American flag on glove, good. Right, U.S. versus Soviets, right. Okay, the two gloves. So you got this right here, right here, the you know the United States versus the communists, which this is movie's all about because the bad guy is a communist. Um, so you got this battle, if you haven't seen Iraqi IV. Um, so, so that's a big movie. Okay. And let's see, here's the, anybody know what this movie is? Anybody happen to see this one? You probably haven't, but any guesses? You can see here. What do you think the symbolism is here? Like, no idea. What do you think's right here? Who are these men? They're Russians. Okay, and what's in the background? McDonald's, right. So this is a movie, it's called Red Dawn, where the Russians invade the United States and take over the U.S., and they portray what it's like to have basically Russians controlling the United States, like we lost the war and they've now conquered us. Um, and and of course there's Americans that are fighting back, and that's the whole story of the movie. But um, but it's another movie in 1980s, the idea that Russians are taking us over. This one here, Spies Like Us, is a comedy with Chevy Chase and Dan Aykroyd, uh, and they're jokingly you know they become spies and they try to infiltrate Russia. That's why they're wearing all the the garb here that they're in Russia and they're there are goofball American spies that have, you know, invaded Russia and in, in acting as agents. Um, this one here, Clint Eastwood and Firefox, this is one where, like, the Russians have this super fancy airplane that can do all kinds of damage and be, like, invisible, and his job is to sneak into Russia and steal the plane back before they have a chance to use it, which, of course, he does. Um, and this one is very similar, The Hunt for Red October. Some of you guys might have seen this one. This is in, in the late 80s, um, almost 90s, if I remember right. It's right around 89, 90. Uh, but this is the idea that the Russians have a super sub that is undetectable and can cause all this damage. So um, the captain of the Russian super sub wants to defect and bring it over to the United States so they can't have you know, warfare with that. So they sneak it back to the United States. Um, so it's very similar to Firefox in a way. And then this last one is War Games. Anybody seen or heard of War Games? Mr. Lamb is, is giving a, a rundown on the best movies there. <laughs> so War Games here is where it's a fear, again, this is where the nuclear war comes in, is um, that there's a computer system that takes over of the United States' nuclear arsenal, and it wants to play war games, and it believes that it's playing a game, and in reality, it's threatening to shoot off all of our nuclear weapons at Russia, and, you know, it wants to start nuclear war with Russia, and then, um, you know, and they're trying to stop this computer from taking over, so it has a couple different themes, this idea that computers are going to take over and cause severe damage, and that we're going to shoot off nuclear weapons and kill everybody. So that one kind of, that's a positive, uplifting one too. But um, that one's pretty good too. So um, so those are kind of some of the big movies of the 1980s. Not everyone, not every movie is about, about Russians and, and death from nuclear weapons, but it just shows you a theme that we really play on in this time period of the 1980s, is that Russia is definitely the bad guy, and they're always portrayed as a bad guy, and we're, we're always in conflict with them. So, questions about this at all? In which we, you know, every time period has it, you know, has this, if you went back to World War II, it was the Germans, and, you know, every time period will we'll have that. Okay. One other big event, uh, and I'm going to run a short on time here, but this is uh, Live Aid. And this is really what first during the 1980s. It really didn't happen in the 60s or 70s because, you know, we have the advent of television. And in the 1980s, everybody basically has a television television in their home or several televisions. Uh, they also you have the advent of cable television coming out in the 1980s. And Live Aid is where you have a group of artists coming together and they're trying to support, uh, in this case, a famine in Africa. They're trying to give money. Yes, Queen was there. They're trying to give, if you've seen the movie Queen, they, they talk about this. But um, they're trying to support the fan, help out the payment in Africa. So they get all these artists together, and it becomes, and I think it still is, the largest televised event 
um, in the world uh, in history, and 1.5 billion people watch Live Aid because they have a concert in England, they have a concert in the United States, and also some other countries joined in too around the world, and they're all there trying to raise funds uh, to, to help this. And like I said, it's really the first time artists really have come together and tried to to pull their might basically and to and to do this to support an area. Um, we've had lots of other ones after Live Aid. And uh, you got some of you guys might even know some. Anybody know of any other things where artists, you know, musicians come together and try to raise funds to help people or Deanna <laughs> just loves Queen. <laughs> so there's other ones like um Farm Aid comes in after that where they're trying to, to help the farms in, in the Midwest. Um you also have ones recently with 9-11, you know, they had ones come together and try to raise funds for that. Um, every so often, you any type of like major disaster, you will see artists and come together and want to try to help fundraise. Uh, so at the same time, Live Aid, no one really realized how big it was going to be and that how successful in terms of raising funds and attention for Africa it was going to be. So some artists didn't go to Live Aid. They're like, yeah, I'm not going to do that. So after that was all said and done, they said, well, wait, we want to do something to try to raise funds, too. And they come up with a song called We Are the World. So I'm going to play this real quick for you. You guys might be familiar with this one. Um, let me get it for you. Let's see here. Let's suppose that you're writing a really important email to a colleague. or a post on Facebook that all your friends will see. Skip that. Okay. Or a paper for your English class that you just have to get an A on. Or a resume for your dream job. Or a message to your crush on a dating site. Okay, so I could listen to the whole thing, but we won't because it's like eight minutes long. But just the fact that all those superstars came together in one room and recorded it, uh, it was a really amazing thing, except for Michael Jackson. They dubbed him in and because he was such a big star, especially in the 1980s. They were willing to dub him in, and if you notice, he had like one of the largest parts um, because he is so popular in the 1980s. Um, but so they, this, uh, this record is produced, and the proceeds also go to, to Africa. So it's, it's just a big turning point in terms of the power of musicians and, and how they become influential. Um, and it really starts in the 1980s. Uh, okay, I know we've got to wrap things up here because we're about an hour through. So we're going to play one last game, and then I'm going to show you how to get credit. So we're going to go quickly around here and see if you guys know what some of these electronics of the 1980s are. So we'll start right up here in the upper left-hand corner. What is this thing? This box. Anybody guess? Close, not a radio, but close. It has tapes. Not Atari. <laughs> you listen to it, but not for music. Yeah, it's got lines coming out of the back of it. Plugs into the wall. This one's a tough one because you guys probably have never seen it. It's got cassettes in it, speaker. Okay, I'll give this one to you since we're running short on time. This is an answering machine. Okay, you know, our, we have voicemail today. You check on your phones. Well, this is an answering machine. The first thing, the way you left a message, you would record it. It had little tapes underneath this this uh, cover here, and you record a message on there. And you had to say, this is a so-and-so. Please leave a message. And then someone would leave a message, and the tapes would kick on and record the message off the phone. And then you'd come over here and play it, and then you'd have to back it up. And so the next person would kind of record over it again. So, um, so yeah, first answer the answer machine comes out at this time. <laughs> yeah, it was bigger than the phone. It was a big old brick. Okay, how about this one? You guys probably know this one. That's right, Pac-Man comes out in the 1980s, becomes a huge hit. Okay, right, the arcades become a big deal in the 1980s, for sure. 
How about this one? Anybody know what this is? It's a computer. Lots of choreo. Uh, and specifically, this is the first Mac. Okay, and this is in the 1980s. They start to have the idea of personal computers. Before this time period, the only place that had a computer was businesses, and they were the computers were like the size of rooms. You know, they were humongous. And they said, well, who's ever going to want to need a computer at their house? Like that's what work is for, and like they're big. And this is the very beginning of having a personal computer, a desk, you know, desktop computer in your home. Um, and so, yeah. Uh, we'll skip over this one because it's really out of order. I need to adjust it. How about this one right here? This one on the lower left. This is a Walkman. Yes, I'll have good a Walkman. And this is the first thing that you could take music with you and carry it around and put your tape in and listen to it. And you know, before that, you you had to listen to the radio in your car, and that was about it. So, um, so you had the Walkman. So this over here, back over next to the computer, any ideas what that is? If you can see it. Yeah, it's not a floppy disk. It's closed, Olivia. There you go, Hannah. Portable CD player. So they came out with the Walkman first. Then they start coming out with CDs in the late 1980s. And then they have CD players, and then they figure out, Oh, let's do a Walkman version of this thing, and that thing was like a humongous blick, you know, thing that you had to have the CD spin in, and it was on your side, and you tried not to have it skip, and uh, it didn't work out real well. But um, okay, what about this right here? Yeah, eight batteries, the brick phone. Yeah. And this, this is two different things come out in the 1980s. You have just the idea of a cordless phone in your house comes out in the 1980s. Like that's just not a cell phone, but just the fact that your phone is not attached to the wall, that you could buy this thing and walk around your home, which was like a huge invention. Uh, and then later on, they come out with cell phones, and they're like a big brick, and some of them like got a briefcase that goes with them and everything else. Um, so both of those things first come in. Uh, every once in a while, I, I had I have to find again. I have an old phone that has the dial where you have to hit the you know, turn the numbers and let it come back. And, and my kids always look at it like, how do you use that thing? So um, so yeah, so just going the idea you could punch buttons and not have to like wait for it to come on back. Yeah, and it wasn't on the wall. Okay, what's this one? The boombox, right. In the 1980s, the boombox comes out, becomes popular. It takes like a dozen D batteries. It weighs like 30 pounds. Um, but, you know, it was a way to have like large amount of music go with you and uh, take it anywhere. Uh, the first step of annoying all your neighbors. So that came out in the 1980s, yes. And this one you guys probably will know because there's been a few generations of this. Game Boy, yes, Game Boy just comes out in the late 80s. It's a huge thing. The fact you can take your games on the go, they're in black and white. And it has like four games. Uh, one of them is like Tetris, um, but it's uh, you know it's a huge deal to come out in the 1980s. This is amazing technology um, that you can take a little game with you anywhere. Um, the start of like, all kids being distracted on car rides, and then you also have Nintendo that comes out, and you have Atari that comes out. You know, at that time period, Atari's earlier in the Commodores, and then we go to Nintendo, which becomes like a, a big deal with Mario. And then anybody who know what this last thing is? That's right, Hannah. Hannah's a child of the 80s. She knows all these things. This is a recorder and camera, yes. This is where this thing was probably two by three-ish. You know, it weighed... You know, good 10, 15 pounds. You put it on your shoulder, and it took a big VCR tape that you had to stick in the thing, um, and you recorded videos on this thing. Uh, and it was heavy, and, and uh, you know the quality wasn't the greatest. But my, I think my dad had this one. But so these were all different things that really came out in the 1980s. They're really big changes for people. Now, question of the day: What device do we have that can perform all of these features? That's right, your cell phone. In the in the smartphone, in the 2000s, a smartphone comes out. It's revolutionary because it performs the things of all, all these electronics were you know could be eliminated just by that phone. A one device could do it all. So 
it shows you just how you know when they first came out. Now I know this is old hat for you guys, but just how amazing the, the smartphone was that it could do all of the stuff that used to have to have all these different devices. Um, okay, so I know the question tonight is, how the heck, Mr. Campbell, do I get credit? I got to listen to you and Mr. Lamb drone on about the 1980s. So this is how you're going to get credit for it. One thing is you're going to go 